And thank you for joining us here on PM Express. We are just a little over 40 days now to the elections, uh, December 7. And a lot of conversation is currently unfolding about potential for a violent explosion, politically motivated violence. And that is why tonight we are having a conversation about averting election violence. Don't we always do this as we approach elections in Ghana? But there is an audio warning that has triggered this conversation this time around. And we are very familiar with Ududu Diodio and the fact that it has ignited again uh, for possibly point to the fact that we haven't made as much progress as we thought we've had in the last few years with all the changes that we've seen in the law and the work of bodies like Peace Council, the NCC and others, we still have violence in a very notorious area like Ududu Diodio. Let's go through what we know so far and what the history also teaches us. Um, we know that one person is currently in critical condition uh, from a gunshot wound. Uh, at least eight more are still receiving treatment following the clash between the NDC and AMPP uh, supporters in Odododiodio. Uh, we also know tonight that although gunshots uh, were fired and the whole incident was caught on camera, the police is yet to make any arrest in this particular instance. And this is one of those baffling instances. Part of the problem is a law enforcement one. If people believe that the police and on top of dealing with chaos such as we saw over the weekend, then we begin to see people take the law into their own hands. Because part of this was filmed on television. A gentleman who was in brown uh, shirt, black trousers, and a, a black cap was seen wielding a pistol, firing in the air, as many as six shots you could count as he fired, approaching the, the crowd. Um, it was full glare of the public, caught on, on camera. Um, there's no evidence that he's been picked up yet, at least for questioning. Uh, you see there in your shot, that's a gentleman, as you can see there, holding the gun, uh, firing, he's moving towards the other crowd that they had moved already, uh, fired a few shots, holding and just firing discriminately. He still hasn't been picked up. Uh, you can see him in your shot there. That is one of those worrying um, uh, situations with Odododio. And we've already seen today that um, Odododio is a very well-known hotspot. As many as 50 hotspots have been uh, identified in this constituency alone. 50 hotspots, one constituency. Now, both parties, and this goes to the police, by the way, both parties accuse the police of failing and have threatened now to defend themselves. Also because of what we just saw there with the gentleman wielding a gun but hasn't been identified or picked up by the police. And it's been several hours since this happened, by the way, more than 48 hours, uh, more than 24 hours since this happened. Um, we also know that in September, and this is just giving the history of, the, of this particular area in question. In September 2016, another election year, by the way, a lady supporter of the, of the NDC was stabbed at Bukom Square as chaos broke out during a political debate. Now, the next point is important because no arrest was made. Four years on, the impunity continues in the studio. A life was lost. Having a debate, somebody was stabbed, a lady supporter of the NDC and so this is the history of the place. But Odododio is not an isolated case. Because we're beginning to see this elsewhere also. Particularly in the Ashanti region, we've seen that there's some disturbances also in Asawasi, right? And that region has as many as 634 flashpoints. One region, in the Ashanti region alone, and I say Odododio and Asawasi, they, they are not isolated cases because the police themselves, they have identified as many as 4,098 flashpoints across the country. 4,098 across the country flashpoints that the police themselves have identified. And so that tells you the police, they know the places. They know, they know that Odododio is a hotspot, potential to erupt into violence. And yeah, we saw what happened over the weekend. This is a worrying picture for the 2020 elections. It, 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 what, where is the progress? 
I mean, since 1992, election violence has consistently be, has become part of our, part of what we've come you accustomed to. A few people may, may die, guns will be fired, but we haven't seen prosecutions. That is at the core of the problem that we are dealing with, we'll be dealing with tonight on the show. And that's what we're asking. How do we avert an explosion this year? I mean, people say, well, we'll always get to the brink, but we will not get to the point where it explodes. How do we learn from the radio warning? And I insist it's a warning because it tells us what may happen. If a peace war can turn violent, you can imagine what will happen when people actually get to vote with all the high stakes involved. I want to bring in my guests who are joining us uh, tonight all via Zoom. I'm delighted to say that we could speak to um, the NCCE um, chairperson who delighted could join us. It's been a while. Um, my name is Joseph Nkrumah. Thank you very much for joining us on, on this Thank occasion you. as well. Thank you. Good evening to you and the audience. Also joining me tonight is the uh, Peace Council's uh, uh, Executive Secretary, uh, Mr. George Amu, is also joining us tonight uh, on set. They've done a lot of work in this area. They spent months putting together a roadmap to peace ahead of this year's elections. And the political party signed on the dotted line, uh, agreeing to commit and abide by the processes in there. Um, and so it, it begs the question, what is happening um, with that particular roadmap, with what we are seeing in Ududu and elsewhere in the country? Um, thankfully, it, we want to get to Ududu because that's where the spark is. Um, and I'm delighted to say that we could get onto the phone lines and also speak to the uh, MPP's chairman for the area, uh, Seth Raymond Tete, is joining us on a telephone line. And we're going to be talking about how to uh, douse the flames in you know, order before it explodes any further and, and escalates. Uh, NDC's chairman, uh, Paul Laie, will also join us hopefully on Zoom. But it is to you, um, Madam Josephine Nkrumah, that I start this conversation. I mean, what happened in Rodeo that we've just recounted? What is happening across the country? More than 4,000 flashpoints. Where is the progress? Well, even um, truthfully, that is a difficult question for me. Um, as we all know, and looking at the kind of work that the National Peace Council, the NCCE, political parties, clergy, office of the imam, looking at the depth of work that was carried out and the seeming commitment that we got from all the parties, we know that it was going to be a difficult roadmap, but nonetheless, we believe that with a commitment that um, was seemingly exhibited by the two political parties, we would be, you know, heading towards some sort of progress. But the signs are quite worrying, and um, the NCC, like other well-meaning Ghanaians, have all expressed their concern about this and their utmost condemnation of what happened in Odododio yesterday, and particularly some other hotspots in the country. So when it comes to what are we what are we doing wrong or what are we not doing well enough, I think. Um, the concerted effort and the commitment of stakeholders to this is key. Also key to this um, very concerning phenomenon is continued and sustained education and engagement, particularly in the hotspots. Something that we are doing, but nonetheless, seeing the kind of influence that political actors wield on supporters, you see how that plays out on supposed peace marches that actually turn violent. That's the irony of it all, how a peace march can lead to such violence. So there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more work for the security agencies to do. And particularly if we look at the consultations that NCC held with many stakeholders across the country, one of the key things that came out was a lack of confidence in the police or in the security agencies, thereby necessitating a certain um, action by political actors to want to take matters into their own hands in order to defend themselves. And we're seeing that play out again this time. 
having discussed the issue over and over again, having um, engaged security agencies over and over again, having had a lot of um, um, statements from the security agencies that they are going to act. I would have been happy to see by this time some action taken by the police that they had rounded up some of these people that you know can be clearly identified in the videos and then we we begin to see that confidence that is a necessary ingredient to the roadmap for peace here. Yeah, I mean that that is a that is a big point there. I mean surprised that more than 24 hours after this happened this gentleman that we all see in the shot um, and from what we understand, almost everybody else in the do know him quite well, hasn't been identified by the police, hasn't been picked up by the police. In fact, no arrest has been made, although we see a lot of people, uh, you know, throwing missiles at each other. Oof. Does that surprise you that that, that hasn't happened, hasn't happened yet, um, in, in spite of the glaring evidence that we're witnessing and watching? Hello, Madam Josephine Kruma. Yes, it does surprise me. Mm. It does surprise me. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, it does surprise me. It does surprise me, considering we're talking about um, the Ghana police here and having a fair idea of, you know, the people in the community, having the ability and accessibility to these people to gather the intelligence they need to pick these people up and despite this failing to have done so begins to set one's mind wondering as to what is it and 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 the the, the silence is deafening we want to hear from our police we want to know that in these times they are up to the task they're able to deliver their we we can repose that confidence and trust in them that as we have barely 40 days to go, the police is alert, they are vigilant, they are acting swiftly to curtail any further occurrences such as these. Yeah, I mean, I want to quickly bring, I'll bring in Georgia, Mr. Musamu, so tell me, um, you saw this on full Nududu, and I say it is a warning and a tip of the iceberg of what might happen if Peace Council, NCCE, police, everybody else doesn't take it seriously enough to throw everything at this to resolve it. I wonder how Peace Council is taking what happened um, in order to do uh, again with just just a little over 40 days to the elections. Yeah, thank you, Evans, and uh, our listeners. Um, I greet my senior sister, uh, Josephine. I think it's a worrying development. I provide uh, an insight as to what we have to expect in the days uh, uh, leading to the 7th December elections. Uh, you know, last year, uh, we took a lot of time as a peace institution uh, together with our key partners, uh, including the NCC, you know, to get our two main political parties, uh, the National Democratic Congress, and the new Patriotic Party uh, to sign on to uh, three communiques. And uh, the outcome of the whole dialogue, uh, which was a roadmap and uh, a code of conduct. Uh, when we met, one key matter that came up as a driver, I know of all these kinds of uh, vigilante activities, as my, my colleague Josephine has, has said, uh, was the mutual mistrust uh, between the political parties themselves. I mean, NDC not trusting MPP when MPP is in power, NDC not trusting MP, uh, MPP when M MPP is in power, and vice versa. And also, uh, the mistrust in state institutions, particularly the uh, Ghana Police Service, uh, the EC, and et cetera. But, but, but Mr. Uh, Samu, forgive me, but just on that point, at, just on that yeah. point about the mistrust for the police, isn't there yeah. a legitimate basis to mistrust the police? Because if you're watching the, the, the videos unfold, we see the individuals there, we see somebody with a gun, clearly identified, the person hasn't been picked up. We can catalog so many cases in the past, happened on both NDC and MPP sides, and the police yeah. have failed to make an arrest. 
and prosecute anybody. I don't remember the last time anybody engaged in political violence who injured somebody, who killed somebody, has been found and prosecuted. That clearly then lays the foundation to legitimately mistrust the police. Yeah, I think uh, we, 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 we share uh, some of this sentiment because we expect that uh, the police should be uh, proactive. Uh, I think they've shown in, in, in the past uh, that they have the capacity, the resilience uh, to do this work. Uh, they have, uh, I think in the last elections, if you should go back to look at what the police did, especially in the, in the general election, they did quite well. Uh, they were professional. Uh, you know, but uh, as an institution, they still have a lot to do to assure the people of Ghana that they are on top of the of the of the of the, of the, of the show and can 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 give us the needed security. Mm. Uh, coming from the recent uh, voters registration exercise, which unfortunately was also mad uh, with some uh, elect, I mean, uh, violence. I think it is important the police should quickly. Um, you know, work on this uh, issue of uh, trust deficit uh, by one, uh, you know, regularly updating the citizens as to what is it that they are doing in any investigations that they have begun. I think it's very important. And also, uh, like we all seen in the video, I think uh, it is not too far-fetched for them to uh, apprehend whoever uh, was doing what uh, was, was happening. I mean, especially shooting. I think that uh, they will have to uh, up the game. I know uh, my, our brother, uh, uh, Dr. Gary Basaibu, I think they are on top, but they should uh, I mean, do more uh, to provide the necessary uh, trust and confidence that Ghanaians uh, require ahead of the December elections. But I mean, going back to the issues I was raising, um, Evans, you see, the drivers of this kind of activities are still remain with us, despite the passage of the law, uh, despite the, the the roadmap and the code of conduct. Uh, why am I saying this? Uh, one, the mistrust people still not still do not uh, see the police, especially when in opposition, as 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 a neutral, uh, you know, a party that is contributing a lot to what is happening. I think that. Uh, we have to work on the psyche of uh, the police service. Uh, some of them are doing very well, and I know they are doing their best, but we have some who would also have to be, I mean, I mean pushed up to, uh, to rise up to location. I think uh, it is important collectively we, we all work at that. Uh, the institutions that are also helping to ensure, uh, you know, uh, credible elections, uh, i.e. the Electoral Commission, uh, the NCC, the Peace Council, uh, stakeholders, including the media, uh, all of us would also have to prove uh, and show beyond reasonable doubt that we mean well in all the things we do, you know, especially getting closer and closer to the elections. Uh, but I think the political parties also have a huge role to play. Remember, they've committed themselves to disband uh, vigilantism. Mm. They've committed themselves to prohibit uh, the, 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 the activities of these vigilante groupings. They've also committed themselves uh, to cooperate with security agencies, you know, to arrest uh, people who engage in such activities. So I think they also have a huge role. They should be able to provide a, 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 I mean, leading, leading facts uh, to the arrest of whoever was wielding the gun over there. I'm sure he or she uh, he belongs to one of them. I mean, I think they should be able to disown this person uh, as they've committed themselves to do uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, the, in the roadmap that they have signed on to and apprehend this person. I mean, it is time they prove to the whole uh, people of Ghana that they mean what they signed on to, uh, I mean, somewhere last year and this year, uh, you know, so that we can all go into this, uh, this elections with confidence, I mean, and the assurance that we are not going to go the path of other countries who have unfortunately suffered this uh, yeah. you know, violence. I mean, and, and that we is don't a, and, have to do this. We've come and, and a long that is a, way. That is a war uh, in mean, uh, to Ms. continue Amo. this path of violence. Yeah, I, I mean, want to. I want to bring we, it we now. Do this. Let me bring it now. The MPP chairperson, uh, chairman for this uh, area of the studio, Mr. Seth Raymond Tete, who joins us on the telephone line. Mr. Tete, uh, good evening. 
Yeah, good evening. How are you, sir? I'm doing great. Fantastic. I'm, I'm grateful that you could join me. Um, we'll also be joined uh, by the NDC chairman, Mr. Paul Lai, very shortly on this. Ms. Mr. Tete, I mean, I, I wonder, um, it's been 24 hours since this incident happened. I'm sure the NPP, you've reflected on what happened. Um, first of all, have you seen the videos of, of the chaos, of the violence that ensued in your constituency? No, I'm yet to see it. Okay, well, were you there yourself, though? No, I wasn't there. I was with the president at Resurrection Power when I had a call. Okay. That our base in Damami has been vandalized. So we have to leave and come just to see what has happened to our base. And the truth of the matter is that it is not only the blue gate that was vandalized, but the office, the campaign office of our parliamentary candidates was also vandalized. We have some youth at Atupai who were also sitting down at their base and bottles were thrown at them. So that is what happened. That is the report I got from my people on Sunday. And I think we all have to, we believe, I have contested election for about three times in the constituency as an assembly member. And everybody knows my position when it comes to some of these things. Honorable Oblilaye has also contested as an assembly member before. And we know him in the constituency. When I was the assembly member from Glacier Electoral Area, Honorable Takikome was my MP. We worked together. He belongs to the other side. He knows my position. But we worked as a team. Sometimes it will even interest you to note that Honorable Takikome will come and sit in our party office, interact with us, do everything with us. He doesn't even bother. He's, sometimes when he comes, they will be complaining that his people normally complain that why should he come and sit in NDC office. We know we have experienced some a little pocket of violence before Neil Ante Van Der Poel became a candidate, even when he was contesting as NDC aspirant in 2012. If my colleague sitting, uh, my colleague NDC chairman will speak the truth. What went on in the constituency before he even became the parliamentary candidate? 2012, I was by then the constituency secretary. We have a small group who normally meet at Songoli. He sent people to go and vandalize whatever they were doing over there. We reported the case to the police. We were invited to the divisional commander's office at ministries. And we were compelled to sign a piece for this team. Yeah. Just to ensure that time the registration was about to start. When the registration started, we signed a piece vote on Friday. Monday mm. and he mobilized people and they started attacking our people. Well, well, Mr. That Van der Poy, Mr. Van der Poy has tonight denied that he's had anything to do with what happened yesterday. But let me ask you this. It's important. It's good that you brought up the fact that you signed a peace uh, pact before. And I know that because of the studio's history, that has been part of the process. Uh, um, in the video that we've seen, there is a gentleman who is holding a gun, who is firing into the crowd, I mean, into the air. Um, I'm told this gentleman is, a well, is, well, is well known to, to you, the, N, the MPP in the constituency. Is that true? Hello, Mr. Tata, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, I'm asking you, this gentleman who we see holding a gun and firing, um, who fired a few shots, He's known to the MPP in the constituencies, you know. Uh, I think, as I told you, where I am, I have not been able to watch uh, this thing. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that when the incident happened, if we are all going to face the facts, I think it has come to my notice that, yes, he fired some warning shots. But there is one guy also called Wadada. 
who was also holding a pump action. And we have seen other pictures, not on video, mm. but other pictures of NDC, people in NDC T-shirt holding guns. Mm. But let us all look at what brought this violence in the first place. Okay, so we'll come to what brought the violence. But because you've talked about the fact that, yes, you've been told and you stick into the facts that it's true that he fired the shots. You said the NDC guys also had pump action gun. But you admit that firing shots, let's, let's talk to you about your, your guy. Firing shots was illegal and the, he, he shouldn't be doing that. You, you agree? Oh, yes, yes. I think I don't support why a gun will be shot when there is a walk organized by a political party. But I don't know. I think the impression Joy News has been creating is that it is like there is a peace walk between both parties. It is not a peace walk. It is NDC organizing a walk. There is no MPP person participating in the walk. And where you see is a base of the new patriotic party. And the people were at the up there watching the NDC uh, work. And I think somebody, uh, according to the report they gave to me, somebody made too sure like this. And they also made four more. So it is like uh, something of a joke. But according to them, there is one guy standing at the this thing. And he broke a Vitamix bottle mm. and threw the Vitamix bottle at them. So they came down coming to talk to the person. So the NDC organizer, according to them, was on the scene. So he even came with some guys just to talk to them, to cool down and other things. In the process of talking to them, they realized that the guys were coming with the bottles and started throwing at them. So they have to run away. And when they run away, they climb aspects and vandalize everything over there. I think that was the time uh, Neil Kai came in. But Neil Kai was somebody who was trained by Van Pee. And he's a known to all of them. He was, he was trained by who? Yeah, the current MP. He was working with him and he's not taking care of him. And he decided that he would not support the NDC anymore. Okay, so the guy who was firing the shots is called Neil Kai. And you say he was trained by uh, Neil Ante Van der Poy. Yes, it was Neil Ante Van der Poy's boy. But, it was but, this year that he left NDC and came to join us. Okay, so now he's crossed carpet to join the MPP. Yes. Okay. Now, part of the roadmap that the NPP signed at the higher level, at the national executive level, do you committed that when incidents like this happen, you would hand the person over to the police? Is the are you prepared to hand new kind over to the police? Oh yeah. The issue is that you know, president is also coming to the constituency today. Tomorrow. And this morning. Oh, sorry, tomorrow. Yes. And this morning, to our PC has to tell the words our position on what happened. Yes. So because of the president's visit tomorrow, I've been busy working on that. But I think after this thing, we'll call New Kai and had a discussion with, but I'm also expecting the NDC chairman to assure me that he's bringing Obo, he's bringing Watada, he's bringing Yi, he's bringing Bruno, because they have all been mentioned that they were part of the people who vandalized the office. Mm. So I think that is the assurance it should be given to us now. Okay, so so because just we know. So just for clarity, you are prepared to bring Neil Kine and you're hoping that the NDC will bring their people who also you allege also hold guns. And yes. so and so that what will happen? You you give them to the police for investigations. Hello, Mr. Tete. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. Okay, so that you give them to the police for investigations. Yes, so that the police will do the investigation. Actually, I spoke with uh, the Jason commander this morning, and he told me that he has invited him. Mm. But I told him I am a bit busy. So when I finish with whatever I am doing, I will get in touch with him so that he will report himself to the police. Okay. Um, Mr. Sadri Monteta, please hold the line for me. Stay with me uh, for a short while. I want to bring in... My other guests who have been listening into the conversation, um, the Peace Councils, uh, Mr. George Amu, and the NCCEs, um, Madam uh, Joseph Nkrumah. Madam Joseph Nkrumah, your reaction to that? Uh, that is, I guess, some progress there. Well, I don't know if it's um, progress. All I'm hearing is um, the accusations and 
counter accusations that we've always heard. But to the extent that um, um, the gentleman who spoke to us, the constituency chairman, chairman yes. is able to identify clearly people who have or are alleged to have participated in this, it raises the, the, the bigger question of if these are known, these people are known, why are they still walking free? Why hasn't the police invited them? And I guess it brings us back to the issue about the same meddling in the processes of law that the political parties often indulge in and often, um, um, you know, um, the intrusive nature of this and how it also more or less immobilizes the police in doing their work. Because I'm certain that I'm, I, I will not at all be surprised that we would hear later on that there are bigger hands looming around and directing these affairs. But I think that the police must stand up. The public is clearly behind them. The public wants to see them work. The public wants the assurance that the police are there to act in our interest, to act without fear or favor. And when we see that, then that needed confidence that is crucial to these elections in the next few weeks are critical for us. So again, yes, I hear I hear um, the constituency chairman, um, but I also want to hear what the police are doing in reaction to this, because I know that by this time the police have that kind of intelligence. Mm. What is what is holding them back? Why are we not hearing from them? What is leading to this communication gap? That these are the real questions on the ground. Bottom line, everybody says, I don't believe, I don't have trust in the police. This is a fine opportunity for a very fine gentleman in uniform to rise up and say that, yes, we are up to the task and we are dealing with the matter, not just dealing with it as and when, but dealing with it swiftly in order to send home that very important message that serves as a deterrent. Mm. By this time, we want to see that political actors have been invited, they are being questioned, and statements being taken from them. And then we see that, yes, the law is indeed at work. If we don't do these things, the kind of work that Peace Council does, the kind of work that NCC does, the kind of work that CSOs do, clergy, um, um, the, 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 the Muslim faith, all of these things, it begins to look at, are we just going through a process and ticking boxes? Or is it trickling down to the extent, to the, to the point where political parties are seen to be walking the talk, are holding our hands in this venture in a concerted effort to peace building? Yeah. But as we see it now, it's as if we are doing work in one silo and there is other activities going on. In action or action that foments further mistrust, that foments further conflicts, that foments political violence must at all times be condemned. And to that extent, where we are not seeing that action, we will condemn that, condemn it only to trigger the kind of response we need at this point in time. These are peace matches that are degenerating into this kind of um, political violence. And so only God knows going forward, the very early warnings that we are receiving, yeah. how are we responding to it in a manner that assures us that come election day, everybody has fallen in line and everybody understands that the security agencies led by our Ghana police service is in total control of public law and order. That really is what we want to see. Yeah, uh, Political parties are critical to this process. Mm. They are not over and above the process. And so they must equally fall in line. So we want to hold um, constituency chairman of the MPP, um, the Dio constituency, we want to hold him to his word in ensuring that the man he, or the, the people he names are 
asked to report to the police station. They are invited to take their statement. Likewise, we hope, and in fact, we demand of the NDC as well, that knowing those who were part of fomenting this very distasteful act, they also would take the necessary steps and hand over these men to the police. Then we are certain that indeed our political parties, our actors who are key to, you know, peace in these times are committed to the process of peace. Yeah. Uh, Other than that, we lose confidence not only in our police, who sometimes we think are immobilized or crippled because of the interference they get from the political actors. But we also lose faith and trust in political actors who we want to hand over the reins of power to. Yeah. I want to bring in uh, Mr. 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 Muso. We, we've had the um, MPP chairman um, make some commitments. Um, what do you make of those commitments? Yes, I think even it is very significant, uh, uh, the comments that uh, just come from um, our friend Seth, the chairman. Yeah. I think uh, we are moving, making progress, in my opinion. Uh, he has publicly accepted that one amongst uh, his ranks, you know, has, has, has committed this act. He has also further gone ahead to name others who, in his opinion, also were part of this action. Mm. I think the police can no longer uh, I mean, waste time or there cannot be any excuses. Now the names are there. I think this, this is public. I mean, coming from someone who it's a chairperson, I mean, I mean, I mean, in such a uh, constituency. So I think uh, I'm sure by tomorrow we should hear, uh, you know, arrests uh, I mean, happening and uh, the police should be quick to investigate this matter. Mm. And I expect that all of us would throw our support behind them. Uh, sometimes it is important they also get the environment right for them to act uh, in the way society expects them to act. Mm. I think now from uh, what I've heard, I think the environment is, is, is being created for such, uh, you know, uh, professionalism to be, to be exacted from our police uh, service. I think it's very key. And uh, uh, we, we, we have to continue to, you know, support uh, you know, uh, I mean, things like this, I mean, that would try to help all of us uh, eradicate uh, violence, you know, in our electoral uh, processes. But I think even it, it is very important, probably with this uh, early warning action, uh, we should probably regulate this so-called peace walks and uh, the peace, whatever they call it, ahead of elections. How do we ensure, uh, you know, such things do not happen or when they are happening, when we allow, for example, the police grants, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the police have been notified the right to demonstrate they, yes. or to walk. And they uh -huh. agree to provide How them with protection. How do we ensure we regulate these activities in a way that will not, uh, you know, happen as it happened? You know, I think we have to be thinking about this. Mm. Uh, it is very, very important because why, I don't know how it all happened, but I mean, why should a peace walk generate into things that we have all seen? Uh, there should be a framework to guide conduct. Yeah. And I think we should be thinking seriously about that. But yeah. we shouldn't forget that the Vigilantism and Related Offense Act uh, which was passed just last year, is there? Is yeah. like I mean, and I, I want to, on that note, Mr. Mr. I want to take a break because I need to definitely go into that particular law because it's one of those that laws that was passed to deal with some of the challenges that we've seen. And I want to take a break. When I return, I'll hear more from MPP chairman. I want to hear from him, I mean, the bigger picture. You know, do, do, do. We're just over 40 days to the elections. Um, what is it that the two sides are willing to do, not only to resolve this particular uh, issue that happened over the weekend, 
but sit at the table uh, and talk about how to ensure that entire year leading to the elections and beyond is devoid of violence so that um, Rodeo Dio's reputation as, a, as an area of conflict and chaos and violence uh, is, doesn't repeat itself this year. And then the president is heading there tomorrow. I wonder um, what my guests expect of him um, when he gets into the Rodeo Dio tomorrow uh, in the midst of all that we've seen has happened over the weekend. Stay with me. And thank you for staying with us. Uh, this is a conversation about what might happen in the next few months, well, weeks before the elections. Just a, a little over 40 days now uh, to the elections about the Odorodio Dio warning and averting election violence once again as we approach an election. Thankfully, I have the MPP chairman in Odorodio Dio with me, uh, Seth Raymond Tete. Also with me is Executive Secretary of the Peace Council. And the NCC boss, Madam Joseph Nkrumah. Let me quickly wrap up with the MPP chairman, Mr. Seth Raymond Tete. Mr. Tete, so um, the president is coming to your constituency tomorrow, but there is a big question about what happens now between the NDC and the MPP to avert violence going into the elections. What is it that the leaders of the party, what is that you are willing to commit to um, in the broader interest of maintaining peace, not only because of what has happened over the weekend, but going forward? Uh, Hello, Mr. Tete. Yes. Yes, I was asking you, I mean, the, the leaders of the two parties, now that the president is coming to the constituency tomorrow, is there a plan, what is the commitment on your part to preach peace, but also show commitment to getting the youth to respect that going into the elections. Is there a commitment that you can make tonight? The truth of the matter is that we have always stand for peace. And I can tell you on authority that what happened yesterday was a strategy to foil the president's visit. And we know how the land of is. They just did it just to make sure that they will put some intimidation in our people. But our people are not intimidated. They are not frustrated. Tomorrow, the president will be visiting the constituency and everything will go on peacefully. I can catalog a lot of things that he has done whenever the president wants to visit the constituency. When the late Nikujua Bebio wanted to honor our president, when the president has taken his seat, Neil and Tee Van organized people. The program is for the president. And wherever the president is and the president takes his seat, you can mobilize people to come to that program. But that is what he did on that day. And when the police was trying to stop him, that since the president has taken his seat, you can't bring your this thing into the arena like that. He tried to fight against the police. And later he has to leave. When First Lady was coming to commission Osha Polyclinic, he did see. Yeah. Just to make sure. The uh, Vice President recently visited so the constituency. So, I, I, get, I get the catalog, but if you may, because of time, just give me briefly. Yes. So, the, there's NCC, peace. There's we peace. Have always stand yes. for peace. So, and we'll continue to preach mm -hmm. peace to our people. Okay. Because Neil and Tebanaman are candidates, even as a person who doesn't like violence. Are you, are you, so, willing, to, are you willing to see to sit down with your opponents in the NDC, in the full glow of the public, you know, hold hands and, and no, encourage peace always, in the area. I have always told the NDC chairman that I don't trust Neil and Van Dapper when it comes to some of these things. Mm. That is my, if it is any other candidate, we are willing, because as I told you earlier on, 2012, we signed a peace bond in the presence of uh, uh, the divisional commander by then, Mr. Oklu, we signed a peace bond on Friday. Monday, they started beating our people. Okay. Thinking
thinking that we have gone to. So I don't trust Neil and Tevan that when it comes to some of these things. Okay. I mean, I want to say thank you very much for joining me. That's the MPP chairman. At least he's uh, talked about what he want to do with the particular situation, the people we saw uh, firing shots there. Um, Mr. Amuk, so let's talk about the big picture now as we wrap up. Because, yes, Odudu is important. But Odudu is just, as I indicated, uh, one of more than 4,000 places in the country that can set a light and explode going into elections. According to the police own work that they've done, identifying the flashpoints. Give me briefly, what can all parties, all stakeholders do between now and December to make sure that these 4,000 plus flashpoints do not explode? Briefly. Yes, uh, thank you, Eva. So once again, I think um, the, the, the parties should indicate without uh, hesitation that they mean well when they sign on to the roadmap and the code of conduct. They should clearly indicate that by disowning their own when they are found to have committed uh, the crimes as indicated in Act 999. I think it's important they do that. Uh, it's also important that uh, we, we, you know, let our people know that there are mechanisms for resolving differences as and when they come. Uh, we have the, 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 the EC itself has internal ways of resolving conflicts that come uh, to their attention. Uh, the courts are there. Uh, we shouldn't use violence as a means of resolving our differences. And I just want to remind uh, people again that the vigilantism. Mm. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, because of the like, bad connection, I want to bring in Madame Joseph and Krumah. Uh, go to the bad connection. I want to bring Madame Josephine Krumah quickly before we end. Uh, Madame Josephine, raise... sorry, let me bring in Madame Josephine Krumah quickly because of the poor connection that we have to uh, Mr. George Amu. Madame Josephine Krumah, so the, the president is the president is heading towards the uh, constituency um, tomorrow. Uh, what do you expect him to do? What's your expectation of him as he gets into the audio? audio? We can we can fairly agree that Odododio Dio is a political hotbed of volatility. And, and so with the president coming tomorrow, I expect the security not to be Can I go on? Yes, please. Yes, I expect the, the security agencies to be on high alert. I expect um, a heavy presence of, the sec of security, particularly because of what has occurred in the last um, 24 hours or so. I know the president is coming on fully in campaign mode, but I think it is ample opportunity for the president of Ghana, in his capacity as president of Ghana, to urge the two parties to address matters such as these in a matter in in a manner that allows the law to take its course mm. to understand that there is a commitment by all of us collectively to build peace and so president the president first and foremost should come in that capacity as a president and speak to the the issue of peace it's important that he encourages both parties in that constituency, the youth, the teeming youth who would be there to see him, the words he speak tomorrow have a great have great potency mm. on um, p building peace. Yeah. I also expect that the words that he would speak gives the police the needed confidence to act swiftly without thinking that they are stepping on any tools. And I, I, I am confident that we would hear some of these things from the president tomorrow. But particularly to the youth and to the two political parties noted for political party violence in that constituency. Yeah. And across the country, I guess. That their leadership, 
in the constituency speaks up and exhibits not only by word, but indeed that they are committed to a peace process. Yeah, I'm grateful, Madam Joseph Nkrum. I'm grateful, George Amuende and the NPP chairman. We had arranged and fact agreed to speak to the NDC chairman as well, Mr. Paul Lai, uh, but his phone has been unreachable. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. My name is Evan Spencer.